KA, he start, uh, Prof Karim start the ball rolling first. So he's, he's the first one to speak for CBAE. And I hope everyone will be uh, enlightened with his speech and uh, you know get all the knowledge that he wants to pursue to everyone. Okay. But before that, I would like to read a little bit of his uh, brief bio data. Uh, as you know, Prof Professor Abdul Karim is a food technology of School of Industrial Technology, University of Science Malaysia, and is currently the director of the uh, Center for Development of Academic Excellence. And over the last 20 years, he has taught uh, most of the food science and food technology courses in the curriculum. And he always aspired to be a good educator and lecturer, okay? and also a researcher. Enthusiasm, commitment, and creativity are the three elements that best define him as a teacher. Professor Karim believes that teaching in an exciting adventure in which uh, both teacher and students participate and cooperate to achieve a common goal. Okay? So, with all his passion that he has, he was awarded the uh, uh, Excellent Educator Award in 2010, and then he received anu Anugrah Toko in uh, Anugrah Sangar Sanjo, and the most pre prestigious one is the Anugrah Academic Negara at the national level in 2008 for teaching and uh, excellence. Professor Karim has been great interest in using internet as an alternative medium in, uh, for teaching and learning. And he has developed and maintained a few teaching portals, websites, blogs related to teaching and research. And now his current role as a director of the uh, Center for Academic Excellence. So he is responsible to design and run professional development program in technology enhanced learning and also student-centered learning. And now, uh, with his commitment, he's asked to uh, commit, lead a very big project, uh, which is Open Educational Resources and also MOOCs for the university. And so far, he succeeded to produce more than 20 courseware. Okay? So, Prof. Karim has also published uh, more than 100 papers, uh, all very high index. Okay? Yeah, I got index H23. I don't think I can achieve that also. Then International Citation Index, uh, journals, and then um, he has also supervised more than seven PhDs, more than 30 master students, currently supervising uh, so many students, uh, okay? And also <laughs> editorial member of Journal of Physical Science and Tropical Life Science and Research. And also in Food, Hydrocolloids, and Journal of uh, Food Packaging and Shelf Life. So we have uh, Wiley here, so it's very good that he's a very pro a prolific writer. So without further ado, we would uh, please give applause to Professor Abdul Karim uh, uh, Alias. Speech. Yeah. Dr. Rizal is our uh, Deputy Director for Center for Development of uh, Academic Excellence. She's in charge of students' development and uh, advisory. At CDAE, at CDAE, we, we, uh, the staff call her Mama. <laughs> <laughs> and when we travel, <clears throat> when we travel together, I always follow her because she will take charge of everything. So I call her Chief. <laughs> so thank you for the lengthy uh, introduction. I don't expect you to read every line of, of my brief uh, biodata because there is not a Sharahan Umum professor. <laughs> I haven't done mine after seven, year, seven, or, seven or eight years now. All right, uh, first of all, I, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome of all of you in this, um, uh, our CDE program, which is a monthly um, seminar series. So, well, we're supposed to start in uh, January, but of course, we are busy with a lot of things, so Finally, we managed to start this uh, this month, so I start the ball rolling, and um, from uh, this month until end of the year, hopefully every last Friday of every month we will have this seminar series. So I'm very pleased to see at least half of the of this room is uh, uh, quite full. So I hope you will continue to support us to join this seminar series uh, every month. Uh, and next month will be our own Professor Wan Fauzi. 
All right. Um, so today, I hope you can bear with me because I'll be sharing with you a lot of interesting things and exciting things. And I will promise you won't, uh, the time you spend today uh, will be worthwhile. Okay? Uh, that I will promise. Otherwise, you can ask a refund for your time from me. <laughs> I'll be in trouble later. Okay? So, uh, for this presentation today, this morning, uh, there are two parts. Uh, the first part before we have the tea break, we do have a tea break, although in uh, this year we have to be really, really berhema, you know, we have to save money and be very prudent in our exp uh, ex expenditure, but we still have tea today. Perhaps by 10.30 uh, we'll take a short break, only about 15 minutes. <laughs> we don't want to take very long break, we have to change that kind of, uh, you know, uh, long break uh, that we are very familiar. So the first part, I will talk about envisioning the future of learning. And this is very exciting, at least for me. But I'm sure you will be excited also. And the second part, this is about open education. And I'm sure if you have been following the trend in higher education, this is a very, very big thing. Massive. Yeah? So this is about uh, open education, it's about reaching out global learners and delivering education for all. So if you talk about reaching out those people out there, you know, we talk about bottom billion and, and so on since 2008, and yet we are still, you know, uh, find ways of how to reach them even outside the boundary of USM campus, let alone globally. So I'll be sharing with you the big agenda or the in thing now in open education and more interestingly the big agenda of our own Ministry of Education on open education which USM, myself, my colleagues, uh, Prof Hanafi directly involved. So I will keep the second part, to, I mean save the best for the last so hopefully you don't run away before the second part <laughs> after the tea, okay? <laughs> Well, um, as far as this, the second topic, there are two buzzwords that I, I would like to share with you. One is, just now Prof, uh, Dr. Rosina mentioned MOOCs, M-O-O-C. How many of you have come across or heard about this term? If, if you can raise your hand. Wow, very small number. So MOOCs stand for Massive Open Online Courses. Okay, I will explain uh, in, in my second part. And closely related with MOOC is OER, which, is, which stands for Open Educational Resources. Okay. Um, yeah, with us today, this morning, uh, we have a few guests from AUCMS. We have our colleagues from, uh, from Wiley Singapore, Wiley Malaysia. Welcome to USM. And, Thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Right. Wow, big question. <laughs> I just put on one slide because I can't simply ask you, but I, 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 I want to make sure that I don't, I don't forget. And I put in a big form. Would you like to have a copy of this presentation? If you like to have a copy, don't worry, you don't have to do anything. Just wait until the end of the program this morning. I will give you the link. Okay? Or else you can send me an uh, email. Wow, nice scenery, right? So this morning, actually, when we talk about envisioning the future of learning, I want to take you through a journey, basically. It's a long journey, but it's a journey that we have to take together. We cannot do it alone. So we have to do it together as an organization, as a university. So. Please, um, don't blink your eyes because I will go along this presentation very, very fast at fast pace and because I want to cover and I want to share a lot of things. So if you blink your eyes, you will miss something uh, useful. You'll miss the scenery because along the way, I will show you the scenic view and I'll show you, I won't show you the not so nice view, okay? Well, oops. Now, to talk about the learning itself and the future of learning, learning 
it's not a one hour or two hour or three hours talk. It's uh, you know, it's something that uh, need time to really elaborate and deliberate. But of course, there are a few things that I would like to touch on this presentation. Is the who, the how, the what, the where, the when. The who is about the people, us, the educators, the 21st century educators, if you can claim that. And of course, the students. And when we talk about the students and the, and the, and the lecturers or the teachers, we actually um, should stress on the accountability for learning. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the three or four years, when the students go out and graduate, we have to ask the question whether they have learned something. It's not that they graduate with four flat or three point something and yet what do they learn? What did they learn? So that is something that we should have asked ourselves. That is the accountability, but I would not elaborate much on this. The how, that will be focused. How, all, all about ways to learn. What, about content. Because so long, for so long, we just focus on content and giving content, transmitting content to our students. So let's look at this from a fresh perspective today. The where, the importance of learning environment. Well, we are looking to that, I promise you, but uh, I will not touch on that very much. And the when, the ideal time frames and flexible learning. So in, my two, uh, in the two parts of presentation this morning, I will touch on some of this uh, aspect. So looking or envisioning the future of learning, perhaps uh, require, require us or require me uh, basically to gaze into a crystal ball. Predicting the future. So, to cover all those, the what, the who, the when, the where, and, and everything, I just actually pick a few. A few trends, that is, some of this is actually in a distant future, some is actually already here. So these are the mobile learning, the personalized learning, adaptive learning, learning analytics, social and collaborative, learning on demand, and flip learning. Um, my second part, uh, second part of my presentation is basically looking into this learning on demand and also open education because they are uh, closely related. So here we go, the intro to this presentation. Okay, let's, oops, well we talk about future of learning, so you don't want to sit there and looking at me because that will be lecture, don't worry, I won't ask you to do anything much today, just a simple brain teasers to start with. Promise you is very, very simple. It's no-brainer, basically. Okay, this is the problem. The problem statement. There are 28 vacuum cleaners to sell and seven salesmen. So on average, how many each salesman have to sell? Well, I'm asking this question to a group of professors and lecturers <laughs> with PhD. I'm so sorry, I'm not... Uh, I, 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 uh, I don't mean to actually to, you know, but it's very simple just to uh, actually set the scene of this uh, talk. So, it's basically 28 divided by 7, right? And the answer, oh, is it the answer is correct? <laughs> well, how do we come up with 28 divided by 7 equal to 13? Okay, this is the answer. Mr. Chairman, 28 vacuums a week, that's a lot of vacuums to sell. And you only have seven salesmen? Certainly. That means they got to sell 13 vacuums a piece. You're right. 13 <laughs> vacuum cleaners a piece. Yes, sir. What are you talking about? 7 times 13 is not 28. Yes, it is. 7 times 4 is 28. Mr. Chairman, 7 times 13 is 28. 7 times 4 is 28. Do you want to go to school, stupid? Yes, sir. And I come out the same way. 
In business, Uh, sorry, uh, 28 divided by 7 is equal to 4. Uh, sorry, equal to uh, 13. So, so what's wrong here? Can you, can we together figure out what is wrong with this? Why the other guy cannot really explain and defend that uh, 7 times 4 equal to 28? Or 28 divided by 7 equal to 4? So, the way I look at it is misconception. That guy who you know, uh, uh, ex uh, exp uh, who claimed that 20, uh, 28 divided by 7 equal to 13, because uh, there is a misconception here, and he's very convinced. He said, "No, every any, I mean, no, any any which way that you look at it, uh, still you get come up with the same answer." So, what has got to do with education then? Can we say that education failed in this case? Well, uh, there is something for us to ponder. Now, the next exercise. Look at this picture. Just let's just look at this picture, and I want I want to know what is the first question that comes to your mind when you look at this picture. It has nothing to do with the future of learning. So, perhaps most of you probably the first question that comes to your mind is what. What is it? Right? What is it? So let's see. Um, Steve Jobs uh, said this on, on, on computers in 1985. He said, All the people sit down and ask, What is it? <laughs> so if you ask this question, then you are the older people group. <laughs> but a child would ask, What can I do with it? What can I do with it? So, this is what, the, what, what a lot of people, or edu educationists especially, when they say, uh, when, when, the, when, the, when, the, when our child go to the schools, when our children go to the school, they actually have a lot of curious, curiosity and creativity. But along the way, the education is as such that the creativity of, of, the, of the child slowly dwindling, dwindling and perhaps vanish. So, it's all about, uh, these are one of the big issues that uh, in education, or higher education, we talk, uh, the employer especially, talk about our graduates, about the, the issue of creativity. 
which is very closely related to our education and the way our students learn and the way we teach. And Sir, Co Sir Ken Robinson is a famous, uh, very popular uh, guy in education circle. He said creativity is as important as literacy. But what do we do in our education system right from the primary or kindergarten even right up to the tertiary at the university whether we nurture that creativity. So Sir, Sir, Sir Ken Robinson in his talk on TED, PED, I'm sure some of you know, uh, he asked this question, does school kill creativity? So maybe if you want to uh, listen to the whole presentation, you just go, you just Google TED, TED, or you just go to YouTube and just Google, uh, just search for Sir Ken Robinson, does school kill kills creativity? Very interesting talk. The problem with our education, and perhaps not our, only ours, but uh, around the world now, the education is designed like this. You know, you can see this cartoon. I think maybe you have seen this. He said, this guy said, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. <laughs> Who do you think will be most hap happy to climb the tree? Of course, our friend here. But what about the elephant? What about the fish? So this is the problem with a system that is designed to fit for everyone. And Einstein said, everybody is a genius. We are born genius, all of us. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. <laughs> okay? And uh, in another talk, uh, Sir, Cor Sir Ken Robinson, the quote the, 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 uh, I just quote from, 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 the, from, from, from his presentation, many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they are not, although they are. Because the thing they were good at at school wasn't valued and was actually stigmatized. Of course, we can always argue on this uh, statement. If you, have, uh, if you have watched or listened to this presentation on TED and you read the discussion, the thread, discussion thread below, the, it's very, very interesting. Yeah? Sometimes I spend hours just to you know, uh, re read the various uh, exchanges, ideas, discussion, comments from other people. Um, discussing about this statement. You just go to TED and you just read the discussion there. So today, ladies and gentlemen, it's about all about learning. Why don't I mention the word teaching here? Well, I did mention maybe a few times earlier. But of course, teaching and learning cannot be separated. They are always intertwined. But today, we look at learning because that's the bottom line. Whether, you know, we talk about strategies, we talk about the different models in the classroom, we talk about using technology, everything, but the bottom line is, does learning happen? That's the bottom line. And um, this is a quotation from uh, one uh, article. Our understanding of learning has expanded at a rate that has far outpaced our conceptions of teaching. A growing appreciation for the porous boundaries between the classroom and life experience has created not only promising changes, but also disruptive moments in teaching. From Educause Review 2012. So much has been researched, so much has been written about learning. There's a corpus of, of knowledge out there if we care to read about learning. But how do we translate that into our own practice, or in our own teaching. To translate the knowledge that we know about adults learning theory, all those things, into our own practice in the classroom. That is a big question that I would like you to ask to yourself. Okay, what are the characteristics of, characteristics of good learning anyway? So this is from Kanoli which we met, I met together with Prohanafi in Singapore end of last year. I think some of us, Professor Fauzi probably know uh, Connolly on, on, the, on his, uh, on her uh, article, Current Thinking on the Seven Seas of Learning Design. So according to Professor Connolly, these are the characteristics of good learning. Encourages reflection, enables dialogue, fosters collaboration, applies theory, learn to practice, create community of peers, enables creativity and motivate 
lunas. So now let us reflect. Our own practice in the last, you know, many years, 10 years, 20 years, some of you have been teaching for 30 years. Do we have this elements in our own teaching? So the rest of this presentation, and when I talk about the future of learning, basically, just ask this question whether we have embedded this and we have delivered this in our own practice. I will not elaborate more because I will touch on uh, when I come to that point. So what is the future of learning looks like, ladies and gentlemen? After, what, almost 20 minutes? Okay, now let's start the journey. We, are, we haven't started yet. <laughs> but caution first, okay? Uh, because we are taking this journey through a long and winding road. It can be slippery at some point, can be very treacherous, so we can, you know, uh, get in, you know, involved in accidents if we are not careful. There are many challenges ahead, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, what are common challenges when we talk about learning and we talk about effective learning here? Well, According to Seth Godin, his guy, this guy is very fam famous on those maybe you know, on instructional design and so on, probably know this guy. He said, grades are an illusion. Can we tell that to our students? Hey, grades are an illusion. <laughs> Don't bother so much about getting four flat or three flat. It's just an illusion. Then they will tell us back, well, can you guarantee when I go out and graduate, I can get a job with 2.0? or 1.9 if you said great is an illusion well <laughs> but passion and insight are reality so what can we read into this statement passion and insight are reality so it's all actually learning all these characteristics of good learning but for all that to happen is actually we need a motivation Okay. I looked at the current education system and said, what's wrong with it? And the biggest I looked at the current education system and said, what's wrong with it? And the biggest problem that I found was it didn't know how to motivate kids. Every person alive is in our DNA to be motivated. I think the current model, and I'm not here in the place, the current model is to do the how can you make a tiny little sit in a class and say, do me 17 times days? What for? What for? So it's all about motivation, actually. Because the adult learning principle says, students or learners will learn if they have reasons to learn. And they are, if they are motivated to learn. In fact, this is my famous slides, maybe some of you have seen this. I, in fact, have memorized every word of that. Eric Jensen, the uh, prominent educational psychologist, I think, he said, okay, let me see whether I can memorize this. There is no such thing as unmotivated students. <laughs> but there are students in unmotivated state. You see? So there are students in unmotivated state so means that meaning that our challenge is how to get the students out of, from that unmotivated state. If they are highly motivated or if they are motivated, regardless whether the teacher is very poor teacher or very outstanding teacher, they still learn. I think from our experience, right? All of us here, I think, because we have been to the university, meaning that we have gone that we've gone through that process, we still learn. Whether you know we know we have bad teachers. I don't know, or average teachers, or good teachers out there, but we still learn because we are highly motivated to learn. So, the basis of this is actually motivation. So the challenge is, ladies and gentlemen, if you teach any course, especially if a course like this, mathematics, physics, and so on, very dry, how do we make it very interesting, engaging, fun, and yet effective? Okay? 
it's no point doing something in the classroom for oh, 50 minutes I have a lot of fun games everything you know you love jokes everything at the end what do you learn so that is the bottom line and yet effective but then teachers want their students to achieve higher level of learning of course all of us here but they continue to use a form of teaching that is not effective at promoting such learning John Dewey again people from education need no introduction to John Dewey he said if we teach today's students as we thought yesterday's we rob them of tomorrow wow that's a very strong statement don't argue with me argue with John Dewey <laughs> okay um, uh -huh. this is again my famous uh, no my favorite video I want to share with you Some of you have seen this, I know. Oh, my expectations are high. How are you here, You ready for this? Yeah. Three, two, one. Ah! And here is the keyboard. Hold on. So I need to go. One, two, relax. Physics works. Okay, that is my favorite and my idol, if you like. Yeah? Professor Walter Lewin, a, prof a, a professor of physics at uh, MIT, and also a great scientist. A great teacher, he has won a few times an award at MIT, best teacher award at MIT, and great scientist working for NASA and so on. So, if we talk about at the university to strike a balance between teaching and research whether it's possible or not the answer is of course possible and uh, oops so this is Walter Lewin uh, he has uh, he wrote a book for the love of physics from the end of the rainbow to the age of time a journey through the wonders of physics he loved physics so much he loved teaching so much he wrote this book but it's not, you, you won't see a lot of uh, equation there, it's just actually explained about the phenomenon, the everyday phenomenon, phenomenon uh, and use, using ex, uh, physics to explain then only the principles and the concept behind it. So I guess after this maybe you will, uh, you will be uh, inspired and motivated to write, for me, for the love of food science, <laughs> for the love of chemistry, for the love of biology, why not? Because remember, teaching is more than just a profession. It's a passion. If you don't have that passion, like Walter Lewin, you won't be able to write this kind of book for the love of physics, for the love of your subject. So now, we know that we have to get the students motivated into a motivated state, then only they can learn. Once they are into that mot motivated state, Actually, we don't have to do much. They will be just self-driven. They are driven by their passion. They are driven by their desire to learn. But what drives changes in the way learners learn? Let, let's look at the, 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 the things that is changing very rapidly around the world that drive the way this, the, the current the, uh, generation of students learn, not our generation, because things have changed tremendously. Globalization the power of the, uh, the, the digital technology, the advancement in neurocognitive science, and the demand of the labor market. These are the four main things, well, maybe more, that drive the way how people learn and the way how we should approach our practice, our teaching in the classroom, or outside the classroom for that matter. 
So globalization, technology, especially the digital technology, the internet, neurocognitive science. Wow, if you uh, if you have been uh, if you are following actually the advancement in neurocognitive, how uh, how the brain works in relation to learning, I think that we can benefit a lot. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, last year we invited Professor Zalina from Kelantan to give one talk on this. Yeah, uh, it was a very good talk. And the market demand. Yeah, the the kind of graduate that we need to produce that would uh, meet the expectation uh, of the market. So nowadays our graduates will go out and they will face with a different kind of economy. We there's a knowledge economy and a knowledge society, and therefore by default or maybe we would say our job here is to provide our graduates with sufficient knowledge right because when they go out, they when they go out and graduate they should be competent in their subject matter they should be competent as a pharmacist as a doctor as whatever so is it just knowledge that we need to provide our students well okay before we come to that this is a globalization Define globalization refers to the process whereby countries become more integrated via movement of goods, capital, labor, people, and ideas. Basically, the world without borders. Border, borders. Everything can flow transparently, seamlessly, into you know from uh, one state to another state, one country to another state, uh, country. So basically, these are the flow of things, capital, labor, people, ideas, without limit. So. The impact of globalization, some of this uh, rise of the network society, restructuring of the world's economic, political reshaping of the world, and complex cultural developments. And what we are most interested, or our concern, is how this globalization affects the higher education. So globalization effects on the universities will be more drastic than industrialization, urbanization, and secularization combined. It is the biggest challenge the university has faced for more than a century and a half. So how do we respond to this effect of globalization? So ladies and gentlemen, education today in the globalized and connected world is about adapting to changing world. You cannot just be sitting there, you know, sitting uh, you know, comfortably in, your, um, in our comfort zone and we don't want to change, whereas the world around us, the globalization, the force of globalization and so on, actually change almost the global knowledge age. <clears throat> knowledge is defined and valued not for what it is, but for what it can do. So relate that with the characteristics of learning uh, just now. So today's and tomorrow's global marketplace requires a variety of new kind of workers. So we are looking at our graduate, the quality of our graduate that we produce with new and different skill sets, critical thinking abilities and problem solving aptitudes. Sir Ken Robinson again, he said, for the first time, we are preparing students for a future we cannot clearly describe. Because things are changing dynamically, continuously. We do not know what kind of jobs, new jobs that will be created out there. And therefore, how do we tailor our students in such a way that it will fulfill every single job or new job that will be created in 10 years' time? It's almost impossible. And therefore, we cannot design our education system, our curriculum, our program to suit certain type of job because the kind of job will change. What we need to do is to prepare our students to face for any kind of jobs, any kind of uh, you know, uh, deep, uh, environment that they will be uh, exposed to. And therefore, we need to create opportunities for them to learn. Okay? Um, professor Clay, Clayton M. Christensen is a famous pro professor in uh, Harvard. Of course, I mean, anything that comes from Harvard, people buy the idea very easily, right? If it comes from USM, we do not know how fast the idea can be, you know? And he introduced the concept of disruptive innovation. So if you're into innovation, you should read his work or his book. Uh, well, I have given one presentation just on disruptive innovation, but I, won't, I, I don't have time to elaborate. But basically, I just want to quote from his book. We invest and we subsidize students' education in field for which there are no jobs. So that's the reality. 
Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, we talk about envisioning the future of learning. Why? Because the world is changing. The world of we are living in the world of constant change, and the only constant is change. The world is changing faster than ever, and our skill sets have a shorter life. So if you, we may claim that we have this kind of skill today, but tomorrow it may not be relevant. So we must stay relevant all the time. Stephen Happel, you will see a video of him later. He said more change will happen in education in the next 10 years than in the past 100 years. Because the pace, the speed, everything is actually happening very, very fast. On the, second, on the basis of second, not years, not months. So the future of learning, again, means reimagining or rethinking relationship between students and teachers, students and content, students and learning environment, and teachers themselves with the instruction, with the teaching, with the practices that they use in the classroom. Um, Don Tapscott, I think he's the one of the famous futurists. He predicts the future, so he always look at the crystal ball. <laughs> okay? He said, it's not that what you know that counts anymore. Knowledge, the content, it's not that anymore. But it's what you can learn. And therefore, we need a new framework. We need a new paradigm. We need a new mindset. We, perhaps we need to look at the structure of the curriculum. Because remember, we are preparing our graduates for tomorrow for the job that has not, you know, does not exist today. So the, the, the curriculum has to be very dynamic. And now we are talking about revising the curriculum every five years. What is this? Yeah. Explore innovative delivery methods. So as the lecturers or teachers, we need to look at our teaching, our practice. We need to innovate. Yeah? But before we can innovate, we have to be creative. Right? It come, uh, we have to be creative before we can innovate. I hope I, I, I'm not, com you know, I don't confuse you in this. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, a lot of ideas that I'm sharing you here, you can read from this book. It's a paperback, it's very cheap. You can buy from Amazon. The title is A New Culture of Learning. Learning and, um, and by, by Thomas Douglas Thomas and John Seeley Brown. This is John Seeley Brown. He's a scientist at Xerox, principal scientist at Xerox. Uh, he said, learning and teaching models, approaches across the education ecosystem are changing. So we cannot be using the same model, the same approach that we have been using in the last you know, 10, 20 years. So a new culture of learning, ladies and gentlemen, is will redefine pedagogy. So if you come from education background, you learn about pedagogy, andragogy, all those things, perhaps we need to re-look, re-examine whether in the current context, the current scenario, you know, um, we need to, to, to uh, re-examine. So the redefine pedagogy because we demand, the, uh, demand new skill, new paradigm, and new dimension will require fundamental redesign of the learning process and the learning structures that enable it. And therefore, this is my idea, um, well, not my idea, this is what I propose, USM, all of us as lecturers, to look at ourselves now in different perspective. We are not just simply teachers, we are not just simply lecturers that go to our class every day, 50 minutes lecture, blah, 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 just like I'm doing now, so for the 50 minutes and go back, oh, students have learned. I've done my part, I will rush through the syllabus for 14 weeks, done, happy, right? Then go to exam, many students, we expect normal distribution. When the distribution is skewed, when we try to change and all these things, right? So I like to propose that we look at ourselves in a new role. We as a learning designer, how about that? I like that, that idea. We as a learning designer. We design learning. So Larry Spence said, we won't meet the needs for more and better higher education until professors, well, not only professors, in this case, all of us, 
become designers of learning experience and not just mere teachers teach I teach you listen then you hafal then you reproduce again in the exam so we can probably perhaps look at our role now teacher we in the classroom also learning together with our students co-learner but we are the master learner of course and our students are just no uh, perhaps we can uh, regard them as a novice learner why we are master learner because we have experience and we have wisdom okay um, so we co-create knowledge together okay this is my classroom my production Karim Backyard production this is uh, the, the what, what I mean by learning activity yeah? this is the real classroom last semester a simple activity that can get, get them to work together So, it was actually a simple activity, uh, about 10 minutes in the classroom. So while they were doing the activity, I captured with my iPad, the, video, the camera on my iPad, a few clips. Then when I, I went, when I went back, I used the app on my iPad called iMovie, just put the clips together, use, apply the template in on, you know, less than uh, 10 minutes to get, and upload to YouTube straight away. How easy is that? Yeah? But that's the, the point here that actually I want to uh, stress is actually about the learning activity. We design the 50 minutes lecture in such a way that we break it down into activities and each activity actually will address perhaps uh, you know, something that you want to, uh, for, uh, uh, our students to learn, the concept, uh, and it will re uh, relate to the learning outcome. So in education, they talk about the constructive alignment. Don't worry, it's just about how to align your learning outcome with your teaching learning activity in the classroom or outside the classroom and your assessment. That is constructive alignment. I just learned about this term about two years ago. It was because I was involved in ACAP in, in, in writing the module. I'm still learning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, because I'm not uh, from education background. But the idea here is we design the learning and you saw in the video just now, there's no much of what technology there just mahjong paper the marker pen the students divide divided into groups and then after that i asked the groups each group to summarize what they have learned in the activity using technology here so this is a web-based application here called padlet.com some of you probably have learned this in our workshop so they capture the poster with their camera they you know post uh, together as a group they are very happy they uh, to, uh, post uh, using their camera uh, so there's a group name they summarize what they have learned in the form of what is a flow, uh, mind chart uh, uh, a mind map uh, then they find relevant video from YouTube and they share in this called padlet.com which is the, the, the uh, web based free web based program so you see here we combine technology usefully meaningfully uh, with the learning activities that we do in the classroom and they have to now summarize what they have learned in this form but other groups probably will use a different form the same activity but they uh, use a different tool which is also free on the internet <coughs> okay and yet another group maybe choose another tool yeah this one is very interesting uh, the students can combine the multimedia element the static image the video the text the link into one document and they can tell a story we should encourage our, our students 
to summarize what they have learned in the form of like this, the story of tea. How does the humble tea leaf becomes a cup of golden tea? Read the story. So when I click that link, <coughs> now it will show the picture. When I click the video, it will show the video. They can play the video. When I click this, it will show the text. Okay. So just to give you some ideas, so it's not today. It's not about showing you all the various tools you can use. There are hundreds, thousands of them. Yeah, we cover that in some of our workshop. So I'm, I like to promote our workshop, CDAE. Please come to our workshop because some of the workshops sometimes we have to cancel. So ladies and gentlemen, envisioning the future of learning, we look at the students now. How do we empower our students? And now we should change the the approach from giving them content in the 50 minutes lecture, in the 14 weeks lecture, but rather ask them to construct the content. So the way I understand the constructivist, constructivism and constructivist approach is allowing your students now through the learning activities that we design in the classroom to construct their knowledge bit by bit. So this is a scaffolding approach. You know, just like building one bit, one bit, or just putting the pieces, uh, the Lego pieces together to form a shape or something. So we use that kind of approach. So let them construct knowledge, develop the skill to learn how to learn. That is the, perhaps, one of the take home message today. Because remember, we are preparing the students not for the different type of jobs out there because we wouldn't know what kind of jobs will be created in the next 10 years. What we are preparing the students so that they can they, 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 they have the skill to learn how to learn new things. They, are, they become adaptable and flexible. No matter where we throw them, we, uh, uh, they, they, they will still survive. Just like peribahasa Melayu, yeah? dicampak ke laut menjadi pulau. Dicampak ke darat menjadi gunung. Dicampak dalam tong sampah jadi apa, tak tahu. <laughs> okay? But then, yeah, wherever they, they end up, you know, in, in what kind of environment, what kind of industry, what kind of they will survive because they have got the skill to learn how to learn. So, ladies and gentlemen, knowledge construction is yesterday. Okay? Sorry, that is today and the future. Yeah? Rather than content consumption. Okay? Knowledge construction, yes. Content consumption, no. Okay? Are you alright so far? We're going to break soon, don't worry. <laughs> okay, um, now, I'm taking you to the next level of our journey now. Be careful, I don't want you to sleep because the journey is still very long. Uh, let's look at the 21st century education. Are we in the 21st century? Yes, we are. How long we are now in the 21st century? We are in the 2014, 14 years in the 21st century. And are we actually, or can we claim ourselves we are the 21st century educators? <laughs> well, uh, I'm not going to ask you to answer this. But to me, ladies and gentlemen, if people ask you, what do you understand by, or how do you define world-class education? Well, you can Google now, you can find a lot of definition. But to me, it's very simple. To me, 21st, to achieve or 21st century ed education is more than just teaching. So you know, it's more than just what we are doing now. Most of us are doing now, just teaching. We have to do more than that. Basically, education, there are three main domains that we need to focus on. And if we can do that successfully and meaningfully, the impact would be, you know, uh, effective learning. So these are. So it's not only about imparting knowledge. We have to do more than that. Yeah, it's also about inculcating skills. We talk about 21st century skills and so on. And it's all also about instilling values. So very briefly, very quickly, I will elaborate the, this, this, these three domains. First, about knowledge or about content, because all of us. Most of us actually, for many, many, uh, I mean, all around the world, we are very concerned about content. We are very concerned about finishing the syllabus in 14 weeks, and therefore we just rush. 
In 50 minutes, we just give them everything and we just want to make sure we have done our part. Listen to knowing, this. Knowing something is probably an obsolete idea. You don't actually need to know anything. You can find out at the point when you need to know. It's a teacher's job to point young minds towards the right kind of question. The teacher doesn't need to give any answers. The answers are everywhere. And we know now from years of measurements that learners who find the answers for themselves we can detect them. And if they're told the answer. We find when we talk about 21st century skills, people often reduce them to skills for the workplace and skills involving technology. And we really are thinking about skills for creativity, for civic engagement, for social life, the full range of experiences that young people will be involved in in the future. In a world where you sit down to do an exam and you ask yourself the question, I hope there are no surprises on the exam. And your teachers say, I hope I've prepared you for a living. How would that prepare you then to go out into a world that every day is going to surprise you? You know, it's full of the surprises of, of the economy, of society, of politics, of invention, technology. Every day is a surprise. Learning prepares you to cope with the surprises. Education prepares you to cope with certainty, the risk of certainty. So, we talk about knowledge, we talk about skills. So the skill is actually very uh, <clears throat> uh, broad uh, topic that uh, we can actually elaborate but basically I just take this from this book The Global Achievement Gap by Tony uh, Wagner these are the seven survival skills for the 21st century critical thinking and problem solving collaboration across networks and leading by influence agility and adaptability so that is very very important so this is where, where, where we jump out ke laut jadi pulau. Okay, because they are agile and adaptable. Initiative and entrepreneurship. Effective oral and written communication. In fact, two weeks ago, Professor Rosna from UEM presented the findings from their research looking at the traceability uh, data and um, the, the actual job that the graduates uh, uh, after they graduate, what kind of job they, they, they got. From the analysis, she found that actually, among all this, communication is actually the number one. English. Hmm. So we talk about so much about creativity, about all this critical thinking, innovation, blah, 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 but the employer is still looking for the proficiency in communication. Okay, that's the reality. From, that's the actual data, evidence base. Yeah? So these are the seven skills. Now, let's think about what we are doing, our practice again. How do we embed this in our curriculum? How do we deliver this? How we inculcate this? How we nurture these skills into our graduates, into our students? That is the challenge. Seven survival skills. <laughs> Why seven? Because now there are a lot of books with seven habits of seven this and that. So write a book with the title seven of something you can sell. <laughs> the first domain is knowledge or content. The second domain is about skills. The third domain is about values. Instilling values. So thank you to Dr. Rosina Mama. <laughs> She introduced me to this book, Excellence Without a Soul, How a Great University Forgot Education by Professor Harry Lewis. He's been for, with Harvard for 30 over years. So he know what he, you know, he, he talked about in this book. He said, just a quote from this book, never before has the competition for excellence been fiercer. But while striving to be unsurpassed by the quality of its faculty and students, universities have forgotten that the fundamental purpose of undergraduate education is to turn young people into adults who will take responsibility for society so we talk about values all those good good moral values religious values moral values and and so on we don't want to produce competent engineer because we have given them all the knowledge they become competent engineers but they don't have values so this is what happens when they build a bridge the bridge will collapse 
They are a doctor, a doctor who doesn't know how to smile to the patient, to be sensitive, there's no empathy and, and so on. These are values that we need to also embed, inculcate, nurture, instill in our graduates. Don't ask me why. Well, come to our workshop, then maybe we can also elaborate on that. How do we do that? And some people ask me, hey, is that our job at the university? That should have happened earlier in the primary, secondary school. Yes, the answer is yes. But we are at the end of that chain. We should also play our role here. Um, so, the second part. I ask this question again. What's the future of learning looks like? Actually, I have given you a glimpse of what the future of learning looks like. Now into the second phase of this journey. Well, let's see. When we talk about envisioning the future of learning, I put this, uh, simplify this in the, in the conceptual map of future learning. Remember, the driving force that drives learning in the future, globalization, technology, neurocognitive science, labor, market. And in order to, uh, this driving force is actually, uh, also, uh, we, uh, to, 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 to achieve uh, learning in the, in the new global world with the technology, everything, we need a new kind of skill set. What are the skill set here? So the personal skill, social skill, the learning skill. And therefore we need to develop or perhaps uh, explore new ways of learning. Learning, remember the motivation? If the students are motivated or highly motivated, they'll be driven by their passion. So you don't have to just tell them, okay, um, before you come for the lecture next or tomorrow, please, watch this, read this, do this, they will do all that and more because they are driven by their passion. Social learning. Learning is social. Can we learn in isolated, in isolation? Well, maybe what? some, but I think uh, that's not the kind of student that we want to produce or graduate on. We want them to learn together, together, together. <laughs> and lifelong learning. Okay, so in order to support this, actually, there's a lot of this where actually the, the, the role or the technology can play a role. Technology here, we should view technology as a supporting role, as an, enab an enabler. Okay? Some people uh, say that I always champion technology. Well, yes, but I use technology as a tool. Maybe you have heard that you, this phrase, yeah? a, a, a fool with a tool is still a fool. <laughs> but if you use a tool wisely, then you get the results. Yeah? So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the rest of my presentation and the second part, the second part actually I will touch on this, OER and MOOC, the open education. Don't miss that. Yeah? Learning analytics, social media, game, social learning platform, uh, such as, uh, you know, we use like, some people use uh, Facebook, Twitter, Schoology, Edmodo, Cloud Technology, VLE stand for Virtual Learning Environment, LMS, Learning Management System, Mobiles, ePurple, and, and so on. So, this actually captures learning, the future of learning, the conceptual map. Uh, as I said, the, the enabler that will support us to explore the different, different ways of future learning is technology. So the role of technology offers potential for expanding the possibilities of creative expression and providing a playground for ideas and images. In order for educational technology to be successful in the classroom, we're going to have to marry the ecosystem where technology works with the ecosystem of the classroom itself. The goal of this is to get teachers doing higher order things and let the computers do the more basic things of is two plus two equals four, all the practice that is necessary. technology that helps us create an environment where students are active and engaged, not just in memorizing facts, 
but in working with faculty to really create knowledge, something like the iPad application for anatomy, I think it's going to help them learn more efficiently because it gives them information when they need to know it. And one of the principles of adult learning is you should learn something when you have a reason to learn it. So, I think I don't have to convince you, convince you the value of uh, technology. But then, you really have to explore and use it yourself. Develop something, use it in a classroom or outside the classroom. Then you can only, then only you start to appreciate the value. Okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, yes, I am a proponent of technology. I have to admit that. I champion technology. I admit that. Because I'm, I am a practitioner and been using technology. So I walk the talk, I can share with you the value of technology. And therefore, I would like to uh, suggest that if you're not yet using technology, start leveraging technology. And you'll be amazed of the power of technology because not only you can empower learning, you can empower students to learn but you can also actually motivate students to learn if you use the tools wisely, correctly, properly and impactfully. So when we use technology, we must keep in mind that it must be in a way that enhances what we are doing. If we just use technology to impress our students, then better not. Because, you know, to prepare something is very time consuming and yet the impact is not there. So when we do something, there's always, you know, think about the impact on learning. So we must enhance what we are doing now. That's adding value. That's innovation. Innovation is about adding value. So, why is that? Ah, okay. Well, that's a transition. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not going to really elaborate on this, but believe me, we have designed, I mean, CDA has designed a training program for you as part of our professional development. We have given you the master calendar. We have sent to the, every school here. I hope the dean uh, will help us to put the poster on prominent place. Yeah, uh, Prof. Tajudin, we need your help, the dean's help, Prof. Dr. Haja, and yeah. So look at the master calendar for our training program and please join. All those programs have been designed to teach you or to expose how you can do interactive and collaborative learning. How do you, want, you can do personalized learning. How you can use video. Video is a very powerful tool you can use. But how to use this? How to uh, produce this? Infographics is a hot thing now in education using infographic especially for those visual learners like me i like graphic i like photography anything that you know uh, involve graphic i love it so if you are like me and your students majority perhaps uh, some of them like to see so maybe you want to explore data visualization yeah the power of big data yeah animation content curation this is a new area now if you want to claim ourselves as a 21st century educators there is one area maybe you want to explore content curation and if you really want to use internet and the huge amount of information there on the internet effectively, then you have to learn the skill of content curation. I'm not going to define now. Ebook and gamification. It's a hot thing now, gamification, but I'm not going to touch on this. So these are some areas actually on using technology as a tool uh, to cover and we have different things here because we have different co learning can happen in different contexts, different subject matter and so on. Just choose and pick. It's just like a buffet here. Just cho choose and pick the right tools for your purpose. Um, now, this scenario now, just giving you, uh, just now I mentioned the word infographic. This is one example. We present data in a very interesting way. That is called infographic. So, Let's look at this February 2013. Uh, I don't have time to find the, the latest information. The worldwide picture, yeah? In terms of internet and technology. We have what, 7 billion population now. We have about 2.3 bi billion 
internet users, which is about represent about 33% penetration. 1.7 billion people are on the social network, those Facebook, Twitter, and so on. And 6.4 billion mobile subscription, about 91% mobile subscription. So we will see now how this data can uh, would drive a different way or new culture of learning. Um, by region, internet penetration by region, you can see of course in North America very high, uh, in Asia about 28%. Of course, um, you know, some countries are still developing, uh, countries and, and so on, but for sure this figure will shoot up very, very fast. Um, so therefore, looking at this figure, the point here is that internet is constantly challenging us, us to rethink learning and education because now almost, you know, majority of people are connected. The world is wired, basically. So therefore, how do we utilize, how do we leverage this connectivity to benefit learning? Uh, this Peter Drucker, a uh, famous guy from management, he, he said in uh, this magazine, the economies of scale are online learning's favor now. They provide the same content to far more students at far lower cost. Um, online continuing education is creating a new and distinct educational realm and it is the future of education. Social media penetration. We talk about Facebook, Malaysia is among the highest on Facebook, Asia 23%, uh, North America 54%. So if, are, if, if we want to leverage social media, we know our students are on Facebook, but how we take advantage of that? And look at mobile subscription penetration, Asia Pacific 83%. So can we say that in our classroom, you can do a simple poll in your every, uh, at, at the beginning of a semester, I did that. In my classroom last semester, about uh, close to 80% of our students have a smartphone. The rest have phones, but not that smart. <laughs> Meaning they cannot access internet and so on. But soon, I think almost 100% of our students will have smartphone. And soon they will have tablets, iPad and so on. How do we leverage that now? because they have access to the mobile devices, the smartphone, the tablet. We have internet in the classroom. How do we take advantage of that? So the internet now is becoming a global mobile network. It's well connected. So how do we leverage that again? I asked that question. So what is the future of learning looks like? I have yet to cover this, but don't worry, I will just run through very fast before we break for tea. Let's look at mobile learning. The future of learning is mobile, but in fact actually the future is already here. So we have all these devices, mobile devices, here we have the iPad, of course those who are Android, you know, but I'm very proud of my iPad. Um, <laughs> Uh, then the smartphone. So all these devices enable ubiquitous access to information, social networks, tools for learning and productivity, and much more. Tablet, like iPad or your Samsung or whatever, presents new opportunities to enhance learning experiences in ways simply not possible with other devices. You have experience reading interactive ebook on iPad or perhaps on Android. You will understand what I mean. It's so. The experience is very, you know, very rich, very, is very engaging, uh, and, and, and so on. It's different experience uh, because you have video there, you have, you can see the animation, everything, so learning becomes actually easier. And we have mobile devices now. Our small smartphone is very powerful. We have cameras, some 5 megapixels, some 8, some 12 megapixels. How we take advantage of that? We can now take a video easily in our classroom, the, the activities, that will become your evidence in your teaching. We can take pictures, we can take videos. Then we can use the app to do a simple editing and produce one and push to the YouTube very easily. We take pictures then, 
What we do? What do we do? We put in our hard drive or on Dropbox or on your the smartphone. No, if you can share, why not? Just share. Push the pictures, the photos to the Flickr, where people are sharing their photos for free. So again, you know, if we just go to Flickr and you find nice pictures with Creative Commons license, you can download and you can uh, modify. You can use. You don't have to worry about the copyright issue anymore. But then. Don't just simply download other people's work or other people's material. Why not we just start uploading when we take a good pictures, say a durian. You know, those Masale don't know, don't have durian. So we take the durian picture and upload to Flickr so that they can see durian. Uh, I use uh, Flickr a lot for my work. Yeah? Okay. Example here. This is not mine. But this is a photo I find from Flickr. I was looking at a picture. I want to do one slide, tit one title slide. The title is The Science of Food. The Science of Food. So I went to Flickr and put the keyword The Science of Food. Nothing came up. Okay, so I, I got this idea. Okay, so I download this picture. This is a Creative Common. Creative Common means you can use it however you like. Just check the license. Yeah, you don't have to get prior permission from the author, from the owner. Okay, so I download this picture. The license says, "Do whatever you like, <laughs> except don't commercialize." Okay, the only thing that you need to do, you don't have to get uh, you get permission from me. Just put my name there. So that is the name of the author. Then, what I did, I download to my iPad because nowadays I work with my iPad a lot. And I use the app there. I want the, this picture to say the science of food or to give some idea about the science of food. So how do I put the science into it? So I just use my iPad and the drawing program and put this uh, chemical structure and, and so on. So okay, la, at least that reflects the science of food. Then I can use in my presentation. But then what I did, I re-upload this picture after I modify to Flickr and apply the same license the original author apply. That is resharing re the same thing after modification. Then that is allowed. That is allowed. So I add value to this picture. So now next time when you Google, uh, not Google, well, Google or go on Flickr and search, the science of food, you will find this picture. You see? So talking about the new culture of learning, look at it from the student's perspective. Can you now use all these tools and get your students to create content? To create content, create knowledge, create content, okay? So, the tablet or the technology <coughs> would, could change the way you teach and learn. And not only could change, but will change, okay? So, that is mobile learning. What about personalized learning? What's the meaning of personalized learning? Personalized learning provides learners the opportunity to learn in ways that suit their individual learning preference and multiple intelligences. People in education for years talk about learning style. Some are visual, some are auditory, some have to do, some have to act, some <laughs> the different ways of learning the style. I believe that, but of course recently I read about this learning style thing is, is not really, uh, uh, there's no such thing as learning style pula. Yeah? So, tak apalah. Tapi, I believe that's a learning style. Uh, because for myself, especially, I like, learning, uh, I, mean, uh, I like learning by visual. So, therefore, how do you cater with students now in this room having different learning style? So, we cannot apply the one-size-fits-all approach anymore. We, have try, we, we should try to cater with uh, different groups. By the way, if you want to learn more about personalized learning, you can download this white paper free. You just Google, learning gets personal, and you get a white paper. Very good reading. Um, so, gone are the days of one size does, or one size fits all. Because we know that one size does not fit all. We want our learners to assemble their own personal learning ecologies, or personal learning environment, to support their individual learning pathways. Classroom, 
as if they're all the same. The least equitable thing we can do in the learning is treat all students the same. Because we know they need different things. We know they have different interests. Just imagine for a second if we approach medicine this way. Say I went to the doctor and I said, you know, I'm not feeling really well. Can you help me out? He said, sure, what day is it today? Uh, it's Thursday. Here you go, take the white pills. Wait a minute, don't you want to ask what's wrong? No, it's Thursday, you get the white pills. What about the guy who was in here before me? What was wrong with him? Oh, he had a heart condition. Well, what did you give him? Well, the white pills, it's Thursday. Right? That's crazy. And we talk about it in medicine, and we outrage everybody. But yet that's what we do in hundreds of thousands of classrooms across the country every day. So there's a little bit, very briefly, about personalized learning. What about adaptive learning? Okay. Um, adaptive learning, uh, the basic uh, concept is users data, student performance, and analysis models to find out how students learn and improve on their experience. Let me ask you, perhaps some of you have been teaching for many years. What do we do with our students' data? What kind of students' data do we have? At the beginning of the semester, we are given the list of students. Do we care to see their information, the demographic, the, you know, who are they, where, are they come, where, they, where they are come from, uh, where they come from, what is their background, what is their prior learning, their prior experience that they bring into our classroom. Then they do all sorts of activities during the semester. What kind of data do we capture? If we have got the data, what do we do with the data? So this is all about now using the data to understand the pattern of how, how our students learn. And now we can adapt, we can learn from the data and we can adapt to how the students learn. Their pace, you know, whether they are lagging behind, whether they are not mastering the concept yet, everything. So that is basic idea of adaptive learning. But how do we do this? So we need to use perhaps uh, technology. So learners can create their own path and learn at their own pace. You can break up the material, for example, into these short modular units of 8 to 12 minutes, each of which represents a coherent concept. Students can traverse this material in different ways depending on their background, their skills, or their interests. So for example, some students might benefit from a little bit of preparatory material that other students might already have. Other students might be interested in a particular enrichment topic that they want to pursue individually. So this format allows us to break away from the one-size-fits-all model of education and allow students to follow a much more personalized curriculum. So that is uh, personalized or adaptive learning in a nutshell. Now, learning analytics. Wow, learning analytics, if you Google, is a big thing nowadays. It's very closely related also. Understanding about data, and uh, we anal analyze the data, then we can now uh, customize the way the students learn. So adaptive learning and analytics learning are actually interrelated. If you have, upload, uh, if you have uploaded any video in your YouTube channel, I'm not going to ask how many of you have a YouTube channel. Uh, so you can go, to, go into your account and check for each video you have you click learning, uh, you click analytics on the left hand side, then you will see details who view your video, who access your video, who download your video, how many times they view the video, where they come from, everything. What is the top video in your channel, in your, in your, in your channel, yeah? So everything is given to you and therefore you can see, oh, I never imagined that my video on palm oil production is very, very popular. When I upload the video on palm oil, I thought it's for my students, but now it's almost what forty over thousand views, and the second, the the viewers, the second, the what uh, the uh, the first one of conversion, the second highest is actually from US. US interested in palm oil. You will, you wouldn't know that if you don't see the analytics. So that is the learning analytics and understanding data actually can help us to and guide us. Uh, to, to customize the learning approach for our students. So, learning analytics uses data, student performance, and analysis model to find out how students learn and improve on their experience. Education is being very, very, very slow to look at data, to look at the numbers, 
So, please now, if you Google learning analytics or you Google big data, um, I saw in the email School of Management, uh, they are organizing one seminar, one workshop on big data. But you have to pay what, 1000 something to go? <laughs> Just go to YouTube and search big data, you can learn. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you want to spend 1,000 something, just go to YouTube. That can be your alternative teacher. Okay? I'm sorry, people from management. I'm not saying that it's not upper. Uh, <laughs> so, learning analytics. Uh, up, oops, oops. Okay. Uh, if anything, if you want to just get the idea what is learning, uh, what, is, what, is, uh, what is big data is about, you go to YouTube and search for this. Hans Rosling's 200 countries, 200 years, 4 minutes. Actually, I showed the video, this video before we uh, started this morning. Those who came early this morning have watched this video. But uh, you just watch this video and you will get the idea how powerful is data if you know how to uh, use and, you know, use it. Yeah? Adaptive learning is where we bring technology into the classroom. The technology adapts to where the student is with their knowledge. So for example, a student might be in a math class and they know fractions and adaptive learning would not bring that fraction content to them. So adaptive learning does just that, it's personalized learning. It allows that student to either object through that content quickly if they need it, or also to go at a slower pace and take more detail if they need it. It really does adapt to what the student knows. The faculty think that adaptive learning is a phenomenal tool for the classroom because imagine a classroom full of students. This allows a faculty member to then know where each student is in the learning continuum for their particular subject. So it allows faculty to really teach to the subjects that students need as opposed to just providing a lecture to a whole group of students. We also have student feedback that the students actually really like the tool because it allows them to focus on that information that they just need to know. Also part of what's doing is building their confidence because they get that feedback that says, this is what you know, but they also get the coaching, here's where you need to work, here's what you need to improve on, and it's personalized to them. So it's, it's like having your own personal tutor to help you with your student success. And so it creates more engagement for the students as well as for your learning. Okay, I think um, we can take a break at this point. Um, so, I think we can just take, what, 15 minutes, 15 plus minutes, and we back here at 10.45. Uh, please come back because I saved the best for the last. So, you want to miss the second part of this presentation, uh, well, the rest of this, and the second part, I'll be talking about open, Education, or I'll be talking about MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, and OER, Open Educational Resources. So please enjoy your uh, tea and please come back by 10.45 sharp Malaysian time. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for coming back. <laughs> um, yeah, before I forget, I'd like to thank my colleagues from the technology industry and to the deputy dean for taking yeah, quite a number of our yeah, supporters from the school. I need that. Yeah, I need the support, you know, because for your information, in the two years, uh, the existence of the center, we, are, we have been trying to do a lot of things. And sometimes we feel that, sometimes we, we get demotivated sometimes because of the lack of support, the lukewarm support, yeah? But, but anyway, thanks for today. Uh, at least I can see still <coughs> quite a number of you still uh, stay back. Um, well, the, I promise you to finish just before 
12. Don't worry. So I'll just um, cover the rest of the first part of the presentation. I have a few more. Then I will start with the second part of this presentation. Um, another aspect of what we, what we call future learning. Although, again, if you look at the title here, learning in the cloud. <laughs> learning in the cloud. By the way, maybe you have uh, come across uh, this term in the literature, in the internet, yeah? Cloud technology or everything is now cloud. Our, I'm sure most of you have your Dropbox to store your file. So that is cloud storage. But the term cloud is just a metaphor. Yeah? Of course, it's still using the hardware, the server, somewhere maybe in the desert of Arizona in the US or anywhere, somewhere in the world. So, <clears throat> we are actually connected through uh, internet um, and our data can be stored anywhere. Uh, the server can be anywhere in the world, so this is what now uh, the, the term that we use, cloud network. So if we have a Facebook, uh, sorry, Facebook, uh, we have a laptop or a notebook or PC or tablet, we can get connected to the huge amount of learning resources, the huge repository in the form of internet through the cloud. So that is the metaphor. <clears throat> so the cloud enables personal learning because just now we mentioned about personalized learning, adaptive learning and, and so on. So the medium now is through the cloud. So the cloud enables personal learning, also allows students to interact and collaborate with an ever expanding circle of their peers regardless of geographical location. So back to our earlier part, the earlier part of this presentation, we talk about the four major driving force, which one of it is actually the globalization. So now we are talking about learning in the globalized world. People can get access to resources easily uh, and freely. Then we can get connected to their peers also globally. So there is learning in the cloud. I like to ask you, do we have a personal cloud? <laughs> do we have a personal cloud? Well, maybe you say, yes, I have Dropbox. I have Box. I have Sky Drive, I have Google Drive, oh yes, there is some form of cloud. Okay, all of you have, I take for granted. But I'm talking here about our own learning material that we use with our students. Do you share that to your own cloud? <laughs> you share that? Okay, that's just a whisper. <laughs> now, um, I'm, I'll, I'll be showing you a few slides of my own cloud. But please, again, I always remind the audience, don't misconstrue this as boosting, yeah, because I'm showing my own example. Because I always believe that we walk the talk, I walk the talk. So there is one cloud on my YouTube channel. So I have all my materials there. Well, it doesn't hit 100 items yet, but it's, it's getting there. yeah. So I have my lectures, uh, my short 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 1 hour lectures, you can find there. Some actually recorded in my lecture room. Um, some actually recorded on my iPad, some are recorded on my laptop. But you can find my lectures there. I am visible on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube and you want to find some of my videos, just search my name, Karim, and USM. You can find my videos there, okay? Um, so that is one cloud. My students now, I just give them the channel URL and they can, can, they can get access to all the materials there. Another channel on, uh, in this case, Vimeo. So that's, I call it Karim's Learning Path. So the same material that on my YouTube, I replicate it on my Vimeo. Reason being, uh, previously US, USM blog YouTube. Then the students complain, oh, I cannot access your material on YouTube. I said, no problem. I'll take my material to Vimeo. Because at that time, USM did not block Vimeo. After some time, they block Vimeo. <laughs> okay, never mind. We have to be resourceful, right? 
So I export everything into another platform. Uh, well, Udemy, not, not exactly Udemy, but another platform. But in this case, uh, well, I'm proud that Mr. Tom uh, Armstrong from Wiley has found my Udemy course. Yeah? yeah. So, uh, but this is actually on iPad. Using iPad for personal productivity and teaching. You can take this course free, FOC. But we know that some people charge $20, $20 40 US dollars, and they make money. Well, I'm quite <laughs> tempted to do that. <laughs> but I said, okay, no, uh, I want to share free, okay? Um, but yes, some people have, uh, to last year, Udemy report. Actually, Udemy take 20 or 30% of the cost that you charge for each, part, for each stu um, student. So last year, a few people actually hit more than 100 USD in profit, selling their course online. All of us here, if you like, if you have any course to teach, you can do it on Udemy free or you can sell it if you want to make money. Okay? But that is not our spirit today. We are not making money today. Okay? Um, yes, that is my course on Udemy, as you can see. Um, but it's not yet fully developed on this platform. But that is quite okay. Uh, yeah. From just now, from YouTube to Vimeo, they block Vimeo, then I export everything to another platform called Shortform. So meaning that now, I make my materials available through many different places. If someone block here, it will go there, you know? So you can find ways to, uh, people can find access to my material anywhere. <coughs> so if you think about this, if you think about this, if you want to make yourself visible this is the easiest way put your course online people will enroll and follow your course they will know about you if you put a good quality hopefully then they will know about the university if you brand your video with the USM University Science Malaysia so we talk about visibility of ourselves we can talk about visibility of the program visibility of the school and the university So there is, um, we talked just now what about uh, learning analytics uh, and what social and collaborative learning. So this is a very big thing now, yeah? Because we have social network, uh, we have social media like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, all those things are social uh, media and social platform. But now rather than using Facebook just for social, can we leverage Facebook for learning? So we use uh, Facebook, we use Twitter as a platform for learning. Um, in fact, this morning my plan was to do something and ask you to tweet so that I can demonstrate to you how I use Twitter in the classroom. But I don't want to take the risk because I don't know how reliable is the internet speed here and I don't want to spend so much time on that. But it can be done. And I tell you, from my experience, it's so good, so fun and I think really engage the students. Yeah, uh, Social and collaborative learning is about new culture of learning needs to leverage social and technical infrastructures in new ways, in meaningful ways. The world of learning is increasingly collaborative. Drive changes in the way students learn. In fact, actually, <clears throat> if you ask the students to give them an assignment or a project, and you ask them to work on Google document on Google Drive, so you can see the things developing, especially a group work. Let's say a group of five students, they are working together on a document on Google Drive. So now you can really see of the five students who really do the most work, who really are the sleeping partner, who just a passenger. Because you can see the assignment um, developing over time until the deadline. Then now, rather than give one assi a group assignment A and all the five gets A, but now you can differentiate. The assignment maybe get A, but one get A1, another A minus, another get C because it's just a sleeping partner. So this is how we can use technology for this purpose. So ladies and gentlemen, learning does not happen in isolation. So we have to embrace this concept that learning is collaborative. 
leave silos behind. I think the future of learning is really to add a new dimension of learning, which is the dimension of collaboration. Collaborative classroom is a place where people can share ideas that they may not have comfortable sharing in class. There's always some kids that are shy and they don't want to like raise their hand in class, and when you're told to do it at home, you can actually see their opinions and you can see all that as a person at home. <clears throat> So, learning through social networking. So, we can use social media for this purpose. But some people actually are skeptical about using Facebook because of the privacy issue and, and so on. Well, not so much now because you can form group and so on. But, okay, you are skeptical and you are, you know, ragu-ragu uh, dan tak berani nak gunakan Facebook. Uh, well, oh, okay. Uh, this video is using Twitter. What do you think about? Gallbladder, cystic duct, common bile duct. Yes. What's the identification of the anatomy as the main cause of biliary tree injuries? Today we're trying this new technique. Of Put those things away, people. Don't text me in my OR. Leave <laughs> that for a drive home. Um, actually, we're not texting, sir. Dr. Bailey's performing a TP procedure right now, and there wasn't enough in our OR, so we're just following on Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. What the hell is Twitter? <laughs> Please don't ask this question to your students. <laughs> if, if you claim yourself as a 21st century educator, never, never ask this question. It's very obvious, yeah? Well, I like this video. Uh, the first time when I saw this video was in Singapore last year, in one of the expo. So the presenter actually showed this video. So as usual, I like to steal ideas. <laughs> I, I don't know the title, the source, everything, not given. I, I don't want to ask the, the presenter. But then I searched YouTube right away. Then I found it. Oh, okay, I can use for my presentation. That is 21st century learners. <laughs> yeah, using power on your fingertips. Get the information right away on the spot without waiting, you know, until you uh, go home. Okay, if you, want, if you want to use Facebook, oh, I'm very skeptical about using Facebook. Hey, there are many platform, platforms out there, and more, more and, and more and more is coming now, coming up now. One is my favorite is Edmodo. So some of our friends here now know Edmodo, uh, thanks to Edmodo. So this is basically a social learning platform. So how best to describe Edmodo? Well, to me, to best to describe Edmodo, if you know learning management system like our Moodle, our eLearn, so I would say that Edmodo is a hybrid of Facebook plus our Moodle. Okay? But because it looks like Facebook, it feels like Facebook, it tastes like Facebook. Smell like, Smell like, like Facebook. Facebook. Then the students, the students, believe me, they will love it. Not only they just like it, they will love it. We engage them through this kind of platform. Okay? So that is how we can uh, utilize or leverage social learning, collaborative learning. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, because working collaboratively, because the students can work together, and I always tell the students when you group, work in a group, take the role, you know, uh, you can rotate, take the role to teach the group. So because the best way to learn, I believe, is to teach all of us. Teachers, I'm sure you, you know this very well, because before, before we, we are able to teach, we have to study again, although we have studied that in our PhD, you know, firstly, we have to study the subject again before you are able to teach. You have to really, really understand the, sub, the, the topic before you can, or before you are able to teach, because now we know that the best way to learn is to teach. The more you teach, the more you en enhance or increase your own understanding. So the concept of peer teaching, yeah? The concept of peer-assisted learning and peer instruction is actually very, very, very powerful and yet not being used widely. Yeah? Uh, one of the uh, famous people who championed this peer teaching is Professor Eric Mazo from Harvard. I think Harvard, yes. He's from Professor Fauvi here. Oh, uh, okay. 
from Harvard. Yes. By the way, uh, in our next series next month, Professor Fauzi, who has spent some time with Professor Eric Mazur in Harvard, will be talking about peer teaching, roughly. Um, so please come because you will learn a lot how you can leverage peer teaching. But yeah, there's one article maybe you can Google. Uh, using peer instruction to flip your classroom highlight from Eric Mazo recent visit. Yeah? But anyway, we know that the best way to learn is to teach because Albert Einstein said you do not really understand something unless you can explain it to your grandmother. <laughs> yeah. So, just like us want to teach, before you are able to teach this group of students, we should really master the concept. Otherwise, you will look silly in front of our students, right? Um, well, learning on demand, I will skip this part because that will be in the second part. So I'll skip this, skip this, skip this, skip this, please skip this, and finally the last part of this presentation, sorry I'm a bit rushing here, is flip learning. Ladies and gentlemen, clicks and friends, I would like to champion this, I would like to throw this idea to you. Now flip your classroom. The way that we do our classroom now, we go into, step into our classroom. Okay, now today, uh, students, we're going, we're going to learn about whatever, about rheology. Okay, so blah, 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 50 minutes. Okay, go back and I will do, give you some uh, assignment or homework and please do this at home. Now we flip that. So we ask them to study the content, give them the PowerPoint or whatever materials that you use in your, in, for that particular topic, ask them to study prior coming to the classroom, and now when they come to the classroom, well, we can take the first 15 minutes to expand and elab elaborate on the content, but the rest now, you have the luxury of time now, 30 minutes at least, to do the interaction. And now if you talk about how to engage and get the students to interact in the classroom, and at the same time you get the syllabus covered, that is the model that we want to, I want to champion uh, for USM, for you all, call flip learning or flip classroom, or some people call, call it inverted instruction, the same thing. So basically, flip learning, okay, the, the concept is this. The, from research, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to ask you a question. <laughs> On average, the concentration span of an adult is less than 20 minutes. Yes or no? Yes. You sure? I think yes. Many years ago, the research said the concentration span of average adult learner is less than 20 minutes. Yes. So that's two. What was it now? How long is my presentation this morning already? So meaning that I don't have you now with me, you're lost probably, right? Because your concentration span is less than 20 minutes. But to, to my, well, I was surprised when I read some research, uh, uh, reading some article recently saying that the Y generation, Z generation, you know, the young people, their concentration span is less than just one or two minutes only. My God. Because the moment they sit down on the chair, you know, in the classroom, they will take out their smartphone, or maybe you know they keep texting, you know, there. Then we, the, the, the eyes looking at them, but the, this texting there. Then no, they will disengage very, very, very easily because there are so many things out outside that need to need their uh, their attention. Okay, so now it's less than twenty minutes, less than two, three minutes. So how do we now get them, engage them, where, when the concentration span is so short? So maybe now, with this, this flip learning concept is, now we upload everything, we give them the, the, the learning material and, and, and so on, uh, upload on our LMS or our learning platform or anywhere, then you do the lesson plan. Actually, I can show you, but I don't know how to do a lesson plan for the 14 weeks. Okay, week one. Let's say two unit course, lecture one, lecture two. So, uh, you know, then what is the topic? What is the description of that topic? Then you give the link to your video, to your learning material and, and so on. So they will study this. You have, they have the, all the 14 weeks study plan and they know what to do now before they go to the next lecture. So when they come to the next lecture, you, we assume that we have, they have got the material, they have studied the material 
So now we're not giving them the material anymore. Engage them with the material. Engage them with the content. By doing what? By designing the learning activities. So, do you think that is easier said than done? Yeah, I'm just saying this. I've done this. So, it's possible. As I said, I walk the talk. I prove that it can work. It can work. So, it's just a matter of just learn how to do it properly. Strategically. So, does it make sense now to condense our 50 minutes lecture into just 10 minutes? Which is the essence of your lecture. We go 50 minutes into our lecture, say good morning and so on, and set up the computer and blah blah blah. Oh, okay, how's your weekend? Oh, today's Monday, right? Oh, Monday blues, blah 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 blah, five minutes gone. <laughs> then, okay, um, can someone please uh, summarize what we have learned in the last two lectures? Anyone? 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 Oh, you, you don't get volunteer to some. Gone, 10 minutes gone. You know? So, in the end, the 50 minutes of the lecture is actually the essence, it's only maybe half an hour or 20 minutes. But now we can condense it even more and make it into a video. Well, perhaps, perhaps if you are you know, um, not good in recording your own lecture, then maybe just record it in your lecture room. Okay? Then you don't have to add. We just like this and the camera up behind can just capture. Then the rest we take care. We do the editing everything. Okay, Khan Academy is very popular for this. Yeah? If you have not heard about Khan Academy, then I would ask you how many have heard about Khan Academy, but I'll be surprised. Um, Khan Academy actually produced a video like this, you know? Short, short video. Short, short video. Sorry about my English. <laughs> what I want to do this video is talk a little bit about the kidney. This is a big picture of a kidney. And to talk about how it operates at its, I guess you'd call it, its smallest functional level, and that's the nephron. So we're talking about the kidney, the kidney, and the nephron. And I think you might already know the kidney. We have two of them. There's the organ that I guess is most famous for uh, fruit. Okay, you get the idea. So it just produces a short video, a small, a small chunk. So the concept of chunking, you know. So if your 50 minute, minutes, that 50 minutes lecture can be chunked into let's say four or five, ten minutes, small chunk. That, according to people from education, is more effective. Okay. So it's a way of delivery. The mode of delivery, the strategy, the approach, you know, can change everything, the way the students learn. Uh, uh, this one, my favorite, uh, is my own subject. So I wish, I wish I can do a recording like this. But I'm not that good as Dr. Kiki. His na her name here is Dr. Kiki. I'm Dr. Kiki Sanford, and today on Food Science, we're going to show you what steak, coffee beans, caramel, and toast have in common. Okay, you get the idea. Okay? So how nice, how interesting that kind of presentation. Uh, it is only, what, three minutes? Just to talk about one small part of the topic. Okay? Um, so flipped classroom, in, the, in essence, is reverse instruction they call it pre-recorded lecture 10 to 15 minutes made available online lecture delivered on demand class time is reserved for elaboration discussion reflection so we want to we want to optimize okay yes listen to this video given in a lecture in terms of direct instruction and shifting that out of the classroom and then using that recuperated time more wisely more valuably to really meet the individual learning needs of students started doing this, I just started recording my lessons live for my students who were missing class and posting those online for them as a resource that they need to access it when they want to, and that could be at 10 o'clock at night, it could be 6 o'clock in the morning, could be on the bus to work to the soccer game. Um, they have control of that. The students would watch those before they came to class, and the class time was work time, engaging in some, uh, some higher order thinking, and the so we didn't have to use our class time for direct instruction to shift that out of the class. Flip learning, I think, on a really basic level, is taking what has, we hope that what we're doing is going to create a far more diverse group of university students because they will come to the university with just so much more self-directed knowledge, so much more passion and information about what they want to do. <coughs> that's the future. <coughs> okay, that's 
probably uh, will stop here at this point, the end of uh, the first part of presentation. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's the future. Okay, now, um, we have about more than uh, what, 40 minutes no less left, and I will go to my second presentation now. Mm, window. And, uh, okay, by the way, the, the, the link for this presentation is this. If you like to copy, hop. HTTP BIT, yeah? BIT.LY. LY, not one, yeah? Bitly or Bitly, I don't know how they pronounce it. S slash. Um, hmm, I'm not sure this one is one or L. Maybe one. Tapi kalau one doesn't work, then you change to L, lah, yeah? <laughs> DV2F capital Q W. And you should be able to download the whole presentation from my uh, Dropbox. It may take some time because you will download all the embedded video as well. So if you want to download on your Unify at home, then okay. Otherwise, you can use the USM's. Uh, okay, there is the link. Okay, if you miss the link, and if anything, uh, you have any problem to download, just let me know. Uh, I'll try to help. This is about open learning, which is also when we talk about future of learning, this is the future. And this is about reaching out global learners and delivering education for all. So now, if after teaching for so long, and we are so engrossed, so busy, so tied up with all our self-interest, you know, building our career, doing research, publication, blah, 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 and yet, after 20 years, in my case, and I sit down and think, hey, what have I done? Okay, I've published, yes, more than 100 papers, yes, more H index of this, of that, and what's the impact? And we, we keep asking, uh, start to ask that kind of question after 20 years. Of course, after 10 years, still busy building my career, and we're thinking much about it. But at one point, we have to think about this. So now maybe we have the knowledge. We are experts in our own area, but rather than teach a group of 100 students every semester or every academic session, can we reach out thousands of people out there? So this is all about reaching out global learners. So this philosophy of education, to start with, um, Nelson Mandela, he said, education is the most powerful weapon which we can use to change the world. And therefore, all government around the world, through the ministry and so on, are looking into educating the people. Vietnam, for example, is up and coming. Yeah? The last time when we went to see the DG, yeah, the, the Director General, he said, oh yeah, we believe that education is the, you know, is the thing that will push Vietnam catch up with other countries. So, you know, so we went there offering our help. Yeah, and we remember the DG, the Director General said, oh, uh, we, you know, a lot of people coming here, but they are NATO, NATO, no action, talk only. Alama, <laughs> yeah, but. We are also in Malaysia are looking into this. So we have PSPTN Plan Strategic Pendidikan Tenggara, Negara, National Higher Education Strategic Plan. And last year, uh, we launched this, what do you call this? Education Blueprint. Education Blueprint. So we want to also be part of the uh, world. I mean, our education, we want to reach that world-class education. Yeah. So it sounds good, raising world-class students. And yet we are still struggling with our PBS and well, that is an issue. Well, uh, Mr. Obama. The single most important thing we can do to make sure we've got a world-class education system for everybody. That is a prerequisite for prosperity. It is an obligation that we have for the next generation. I'm not a big fan of Mr. Obama, but 
I just take one clip of this for this purpose of presentation. But I like the idea. Okay. So if we very quickly look at the roles of higher education, where we are now in this our in our context, you know, um, well, in 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 education, higher education or education in general, whatever we do, actually always fall on this framework. I think people from education should know this very well. It's called Boyer's four domains of scholarship. So we have the scholarship of discovery, so research basically, scholarship of teaching or learning and learning, total scholarship of teaching and learning, scholarship of integration, the inter, intra disciplinary, transdisciplinary, all those things, application, scholarship of education. How now we translate our knowledge and we take it out and benefit the society at large. So the role of higher education, well, there is some of this to nurture the future nation builders to seed creative and innovative mind to create and expand the frontier of knowledge via research to disseminate knowledge through our publication books and, and so on and yet and now we have all those technology the social media and, and so on just write a blog article already you can spread your knowledge how many of you have blogs here never mind uh, <laughs> okay and to contrib contribute back to society so this is very much in line with what the United Nations you know are trying to do which is they are championing the education for everyone has the right to education or UNESCO United Nations UNESCO education for all so I'm trying to put in context in the proper context what this open education means so it just means that it's just make it open make it accessible and with minimal cost or even free and now we have a platform we have a platform in the form of technology platform there are many so many platform out there even the, the writing a blog a blog also can be a platform a way for now for you to share your knowledge if you just publish in the impact factor journal of 50 and yet is being read by a small peers our own peers the knowledge just stay there but if we publish it on the uh, internet on the website or in the blog it will spread out and reach a lot more people out there so education ladies and gentlemen we talk about reaching out global learners but we know that a lot of people around the world even in our own country also are not or have not uh, good access to education so access to education in any form is still a challenge into many parts of the world and you know that this in our country uh, and in of course in some of the less developed country education is still uh, not easily accessible though so the philosophy of education just now just education in general context but now when we talk about open education is about reaching out global learners but then it's very nice to say of reaching out the global learners but what are we doing now are we reaching out the global learners look at our what we are doing our practice now we teach in our classroom right and we go there 50 minutes close the door okay let's start a lecture it all happens in this four wall the physical boundary of this classroom then some people say we treat our classroom like a secret garden it's a closed system constrained by the physical boundary and it just finished here what happens in this classroom stay here when I go out just you know everything will remain here and remain here so we treat the classroom as a secret garden don't you think so the this phrase secret garden is always used in the context of supervision supervising our graduate students the students come to our room we close the door do you close the door I close the door <laughs> because I can't get. we close the door then we talk we you know supervise what ha what what happened between me and a student just within that confine of the physical classroom so that's the word the phrase secret gardens come from but our classroom without we realize is also a secret garden okay so now we have to step out we have to open the gates let it out let it open 
open the secret garden, step out from the boundary of the classroom. How? By putting your resources out there. Just now I mentioned, right? So the future of learning, my colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, is open. Okay? Uh, open means what? Okay? Open source, like our Moodle, is open source. Free resources, research that is public, available on the web, not only on, in the journals. Free courses, like those available now on Coursera, EDX, then line line, open license. So now it's open versus proprietary. In the old days, uh, many years ago, when we produce something that say, you know, oh, we prepare our teaching material, then we keep it to ourselves. Then when the new friend, new lecturers come back, take over the course, do we share? It used to be, you know, oh no, no, no. I have spent months, years, hours, thousand hours to, pr to, to produce this material. Why should I easily share with other people? Leave that kind of mentality behind. Because we are also using other people's material. Right? So now it's uh, the spirit of sharing. I always tell a student, sharing is caring. Okay? In the context of education, of course. <laughs> you know, to share everything, right? Uh, so open means few barriers. Anyone could be a player. Anyone. You know, you can offer the course on Udemy. You can put your YouTube uh, on, on YouTube. Anyone could be a player and this challenges all providers of education. To the extent that, yeah, this is what now, we come to this uh, another trend of the learning on demand. What's the meaning of learning on demand or uh, on demand learning? It means that anytime, anywhere, 24-7. iTunes, you. Not iTunes, yeah? iTunes do biasa orang untuk apa ni music dan sebagainya. Ini iTunes U. U stand for university. Uh, I don't know how many of you have taken advantage of iTunes U, but if you have not, then maybe immediately after you go back, go to your iTunes U and see, you see. For all you know, all the course that, the course that you are teaching there, there, already you can find on iTunes U, offered by other universities around the world, and you can see, oh wow. Oh wow, you know, it's much better than what I've been teaching all this while. You see? Then you see the 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 the, the thing is when the students go to iTunes U, let's say he want to he is studying chemistry in USM here. And when he found wow, so many courses on uh, chemistry, chemistry 101, organic chemistry 101. And it's taught by you know the prominent professors from Stanford, MIT and so on, and when they look at the lecture, wow, and they will start comparing. They will start comparing. Wow, 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 why not? Oh, yeah. So, um, you can find it, for example, yeah? This is how the iTunes U, U looks like. Well, I, I actually prefer to explore, to use iTunes U on my iPad because it looks gorgeous. Yeah? But on the laptop also okay lah. Eh? So, ladies and gentlemen, learning, learning on demand is about this. I want to learn something just in case I need to use that knowledge. I want to learn something just in time. Hey, I want to learn, I want to cook uh, telur goreng, you know, fried egg. S silly example, but okay, I don't know how to cook this, whatever. Then I go to YouTube. And my friend, Professor Hanafi, told me her daughter learned to bake chocolate cake and this is a YouTube next to her, okay, mix this, two spoonful of this, one spoon, and she baked a nice chocolate cake just watching the YouTube. Just in time, and just enough. Hey, I want to learn about chocolate cake, I don't want to learn about all the cakes. Just enough, and just for me. That is personalized, right? So that is learning on demand now. Well, that's what it means in a nutshell. So learning in demand means we learn best by acquiring information that is relevant to us in the moment based on our current context. Who needs encyclopedia? Right? Who needs encyclopedia? 
I just learn the bit that I need at that time, at that moment, just enough. I don't want to learn about all the making all the all types of cake. I just want to learn about chocolate cake. People expect to work, learn, socialize, and play whenever, whenever they want to. And when we say that um, the students now can find the best courses on iTunes U and other learning platform, don't you think that and then when they see all these courses, much better than the way we present the same course in our classroom, what do you think they think about how we teach the course? So, John Landau, I, my friend Professor Hanafi, had the privilege to, 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 to meet him uh, in Las Vegas two years ago. He's a very down-to-earth person. If the name doesn't ring any bell, maybe you know that this movie, he's a producer of Titanic and Avatar. He worked together with John Cameron. He gave the keynote speech on the, on, uh, during the conference, the first speaker. Very, very uh, interesting talk. He talked about using technology in the movie. How he developed the technology that, that actually did not exist at that time to shot the scenes and so on. And later that technology became uh, uh, used for other movies. But then, we try to relate how technology in education can really play a role. And he said this. He said this. You, if you want to watch this, uh, you can find on YouTube. You just search John Landau, uh, Dev Learn DEV, Dev Learn 2012. You can find his presentation there. But he said this. Educators in the 21st century are at risk of becoming irrelevant. Wow. We become irrelevant I, this is something that uh, really um, you don't want to happen to you, right? so how do we stay relevant? why he said bec uh, becoming irrelevant? because the world now is a, is a global classroom if, if a student can learn the best chemistry, the chemistry from the best professors in the world so what's the point of coming into the class the same course but listening to uh, and, and you know, the way we teach and, and so on maybe so boring and, and so, so that, that they said oh, I don't want to go to the class anymore I just watch all these lectures I can find for the whole course I check the syllabus everything I can learn on my own that's learning on demand again okay so meaning that we can become irrelevant if we don't do something what is that something we need to now make ourselves relevant by adding value in the course that we are teaching something that our students cannot find out there so that is something that we need to think how do we add value something that, that is special the students cannot find anywhere on the internet even okay huh? the human, touch. human touch okay that's the Rosina. human touch I like it okay so the world ladies and gentlemen now become a global classroom there's no more secret garden there's no more boundary that confine us within, uh, you know, within the space. So a global class is an example, of course, from Yale, open Yale courses. If you want to see an example of this course, you can go to YouTube and find one course I want to recommend to you to get the case, the idea. The course is Justice 101. You know, I just uh, I just saw that on the iTunes U that I was curious and just watch, click and watch. And finally, I end up watching that one hour lecture. Why? Because, and uh, this 101 course, so it was it's a common course, I, I suppose. And it was given in a big auditorium, probably more than, probably 500 students or more. And this is a professor in full suits, with tie and so on. Basically, just talk walk and talk and walk that's all just lecture center that we, we always say you know but because of the way he present the material and the, the, the way he connect the ideas and the, the case because he's a lawyer the real case that he bring into this and he try to invoke curiosity he threw a question okay he give a scenario okay let's say this and that and knowing that this is the fact 
knowing that it is so what do you think will happen so that kind of thing so it was really the, that one hour really invoking and provoking a lot of thoughts on the audience and they have a system where they can respond and they can, the student can respond and actually can see the speech watch that and you will see you get the idea of how really we can engage a student even without much technology um, so this is uh, an example of so for those who are not familiar with open education uh, so maybe a brief history how it has evolved so basically it started with MIT in back in 2001 yeah started with OCW open courseware so that is the first acronym that maybe you want to you know uh, register in your mind OCW stand for open courseware then at the same time people start developing materials PowerPoint notes everything video and they put up on YouTube and so on they share openly and freely so that is called open educational resources OER okay and then in, uh, in the last two years this thing evolved into so-called MOOCs Massive Open Online Course so from MIT OCW in 2001 to UNESCO OER to Small Beginning in 2008 by George Simon in Canada to MOOCs so MOOCs stands for so OER is actually about open educational resources that we develop that we share we can people can take our material without asking permission because we use a creative common common license the only thing they need to do is to give credit to the original author so it's uh, the concept of VR is about reuse the material remember the, pic the burger picture that I show you I reuse the picture I modify the picture then I reshare redistribute uh, remix modify so it's about reuse revise remix re redistribute if you go to slide share where people share their PowerPoint you can download some uh, some people uh, allow you to download the PowerPoint and you can still one or two slides provided the PowerPoint was licensed under Creative Commons so you just take any slide put your own material that is remix then you can share again under using the same license that the original author used there are six types of licenses so I don't have time to elaborate but this uh, can you can come to our OER workshop then you learn everything so there is OER in a nutshell then you can make it available on uh, many platforms your iTunes you and so on so OER ladies and gentlemen is about spreading wild seeds meaning that this is your knowledge now a small amount then you put it up there people use that and another people another you know person will expand on that so big things become more and more expand further so the knowledge spreads and disseminated at the same time um, the reason why now we are, not, we are not very concerned now about copyright if your excuse for not doing this because of the copyright if your reason is bad then I call it is an excuse because there are ways to address this because we have now creative common and so you just need to learn how okay um, so the trailblazers so when come to open education MIT actually is the trailblazers yeah they started with MIT open courseware in 2001 then this this uh, uh, this professor from Stanford professor Tran uh, jump on the bandwagon and you know embark on uh, he offered his course on artificial intelligence offered to Stanford students you know around perhaps 60 to 100 students and he, he said he he he, and he discussed with his co-lecturer he said why don't we offer this open online and suddenly when he start to offer this online 160 students enrolled that is massive so that's why it's called MOOCs massive open online course it's really massive and he said if I were to teach this number 160 students it will take me what 40 50 years to teach or more in Stanford to reach this number or maybe more you see and finally only 40,000 for zero thousand students 
uh, what, um, which uh, uh, get the certification, but they have to pay nominal fee, only very little, you know, a fraction of the fee paid by Stanford students. So ladies and gentlemen, you learn about OER, you learn about OCW, now you learn about MOOCs. You better get familiar with this term, MOOCs, M-O-O-C, Massive Open Online Courses. If you Google MOOCs, you will get probably about 24 million hits. Okay? There, you have it. Massive Open Online Courses. And I don't know whether it's good news or bad news, our Ministry of Education now is going big into these books. So it's top-down agenda, top-down project for the Ministry. And I don't know whether it's fortunate or unfortunately, USM also directly involved in this, myself and Professor Hanafi, with the Ministry. So we are now engaged with the Ministry and to embark on these MOOCs. So you better go get yourself familiar with MOOCs because it's coming to you right on your doorstep. Don't blame me, I'm just the workhorse for the ministry. Okay? Um, well, for, uh, recently, University of Queensland, our close neighbor, launched their first MOOC. They launched four courses on MOOC in the MOOC um, uh, format. And this course, The Science of Everyday Thinking, one, one registered, uh, this one. Oh, no, no, this one, um, on, this one on EDX platform, yeah? I register lah. Tapi we register, tetap habis. Okay? And this course, uh, within a few days, 50 students enroll. Uh, 50, 50,000. The IC50, 50,000 students enroll. Okay, the the problem with one of the issue with MOOCs, we started well, always start very well, 50,000, 100,000, but the attrition rate, the completion rate, meaning that the students that go through the complete course is only uh, can run between anywhere between four to ten percent. But let's say ten percent on average, ten percent of 50,000 is what? 5,000. Wow, that's still massive. How many can you, uh, how many years will take you in your own course to, take, to teach 5,000 students? Right, it's still massive. Uh, yeah, 70,000 students enroll, uh, not 50, 70,000 students enroll. And anyone actually can register for this for free. The science of everyday thinking. Wow, if you are really passionate into learning, because you think of all these courses on this different platform, like, oh, you crazy, oh. I want to learn this, I want to learn this, I want to learn this. Just like you go into like a Park Royal Hotel with all the foods there, oh, I want to take this, I want to take this. Uh, in the end, you cannot, you can finish, you cannot, you cannot eat everything, right? Just like me, lah. I enroll into this course, enroll in, but in the end, I just go halfway here and there because very busy, right? So, it's there. Learning on the fingertips now. So MOOCs, well, there are many views here, pros and cons. Don't bother about the, the cons part. These are all negative. Look at the positive part, okay? But if anything, if people are try to challenge or try to argue, I would say, well, it's about, it's MOOCs is not about replacing the traditional universities but it is about widening access to education okay i'll get it done everything in five minutes then we are done okay so again i like to repeat this step out from our secret garden that to start with so let me ask you what how do you feel about let's say recording your lecture in the classroom you don't have to do anything, just call us. And we do the recording, everything. Then we do the editing, everything. Then we just tell you, okay, it's ready, we can upload to YouTube. 
How do you feel about it? Uh, huh? Sorry? Yeah, the whole semester. Yes, we we do the we do the the what the 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 hard part lah. You don't have to worry anything. We just give you us the timetable. You just walk into the classroom, blah blah blah, and at the back we just capture everything. But some people tell me some of our clients that oh I, I just don't start teaching two years, still struggling. You know I don't have confidence. Okay, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> But someone who has been teaching for 20 years? Still no confidence. Still no confidence. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't want to go any further on that. <laughs> but let me ask you this question. Don't you want to be part of the global network of universities and educators who are now offering their course online so you want to be part of 196 countries and be part of the global society and be part of this you know you can see here uh, these are oh no these are the platform if you want to teach your course platform no problem there are the many platform the most popular one is Coursera What you're teaching? So where, are your, where is your subject here? Uh, the most popular seems to be humanities. Coursera. This is how it looks like. EDX is a consortium of universities: um, Stanford, Harvard, MIT. Uh, our Walter Lewin there is very famous. Uh, this is Academic Earth, another platform. Udacity. Oh, oh so there are so many, yeah? This is Open Library. Okay. The rest is actually the presentation. This was prepared for the minister. So, uh, don't worry. But at the end of the day, the value of MOOCs is not the MOOCs per se. It's the spin-off of MOOCs yeah? so basically the, the value of MOOCs may not be the MOOCs themselves but rather the plethora of new innovations and added services as a spin off how to get started you want to do MOOCs a journey of a thousand miles must begin with a single step so start small my advice So I'm sure this almost three hours towards the end, probably you feel, I hope, what we hope to achieve in this, uh, today's uh, seminar is just to give you what's there, out there, what's coming to us, the future, the current, the existing, and now with all that, just put your, ourself, yourself in the context of everything that you have seen in the last few hours and see how much we can do how much we can uh, contribute or how we can now change our role, our mindset you know, change the whole thing so that now we can be part and parcel of this uh, future learning so closing remarks so yeah Peter Drucker said there's a last slide I think so 30 years from now the big university campuses will be relics such totally uncontrollable expenditures without any visible improvement in either the content or the quality of education means that the system is rapidly becoming untenable Mox for breakfast, anyone? With that, thank you very much. <laughs>